Hi, friends. Welcome to the By Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Hoover, and I'm so glad you're here. Each week this season, I'm talking with a guest about a specific experience in their life, letting us step into their shoes so we can learn better how to love our brothers, sisters, family members, and neighbors. This episode is sponsored by The Good Book Company, publishers of Hoping for Happiness by self-confessed recovering cynic Barnabas Piper. In this book, he helps us to throw off both the unrealistic expectations that end in disappointment and the guilty sense that Christians are not meant to have fun. He shows us how having a clear view of the reality of the fall and the promise of redemption frees us to live a life that's grounded, hopeful, and genuinely happy. Pick up a copy of Hoping for Happiness at thegoodbook.com or wherever good books are sold. Support for By Faith is provided by b and Publishers, publisher of UBU by Jamie Ivey. Have you ever felt held back from the abundant life God promises you? Do you ever look at the satisfaction and success in other people's lives and wonder where yours is? In UBU, beloved podcast host of The Happy Hour, Jamie Ivey reveals that the abundant life we all want might be closer than we thought. She shows us how to throw out false definitions of success, give up the idea that you must have someone else's skills, talents, family, or resources to succeed, and to start leaving your deepest mark on the world by living your story. This is an important message for women everywhere, so pick up a copy of UBU for you and a friend today. Today, my guest on By Faith is Dr. Grace English. Grace shares her experience with having an abortion as a college student and how that abortion continued to haunt her into her marriage and into motherhood, which she now knows to be post-abortion trauma. She shares what made her decide to tell someone about the abortion, how she came to understand Christ's forgiveness, and what she wants Christians to know about the many men and women in our lives who have been affected by abortion. At the end, Grace also speaks to those who are listening who've had an abortion. So if that's you, I hope you'll listen all the way to the end to hear Grace's words directly to you. Here, friends, is my conversation with Grace English. Welcome, Grace, to By Faith. I'm so glad to have you. Yes, it's wonderful to be here, Christine. So before we jump in, will you just introduce yourself to my listeners and let us know, tell us about your family, what you do, where you live, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, I am Dr. Grace English and my husband, John, and I moved to Tyler in 1997. And so the first month we moved here, Christine, I knew we wanted to start a family. So um, 23 years later, we have three wonderful kids who love the Lord and, and that is the reason why I actually knew I needed healing from my past abortion. And so I just thought, you know, for a, the longest time that my abortion was a secret that did not need to be dealt with. Uh-huh. And even after becoming a believer, that is when the Lord just said, truly, you need to open your eyes yeah. kind of thing. So, yeah. well, can yeah, I stop so, you right there before you keep going? I want to know. When you, you said you moved to Tyler, you were married, were you already a Christian or when, when did that happen for you? Yes. So I was a Christian. Um, and so Christine, I don't know if you want me to go back into my actual testimony and when all of that, you know, transpired, because even being a Christian, I still did not deal with my abortion. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that that was tucked away very, very deep in my heart as a believer in the church, thinking I'm the only one who's had an abortion, even though the statistics tell you it's one one out of three women who have had an abortion. But Christine, I had everything on the outside. I had a beautiful husband, great job, beautiful kids, but something inside of me was just not right. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was something I definitely had to deal with. And and, and I did finally. So Mm -hmm. So as I share my testimony with you, I wasn't a believer when I had my abortion, but I knew right from wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think anybody, regardless of their faith, know what is happening when they choose to abort your own child. Mm-hmm. Christine, I grew up in an Asian household, very strict parents, and school and academics were pretty much their own focus for us. 
So when I left for college at UT Austin, I did not ever want to return home. And I was a, essentially a very rebellious child, but it, I thought I was normal because all of the other kids that we knew at school, they were all drinking, doing whatever they wanted. We had a freedom per se, but, and I was not a believer. I knew there was a God, but I did not have a relationship with him. So that first semester of my freshman year at UT Austin, I had found my first boyfriend and he finally made me feel loved. He made me feel accepted because I was never good enough for my parents. So we became sexually active and the second month of my semester, I found out I was pregnant. Hmm. And I don't know why I was so surprised at the fact that I got pregnant. You know, most young women, young girls, they don't realize what they're playing with. And I just remember calling my best friend and I told her what happened and she was like, you have no other choice but to have an abortion. And once she said those words, that's where my, that's, that was what I was going to do. Because in 1985, abortion was legal, just like it is now. And I thought the law is there to protect women and it is my right and my choice to do. And this decision was not going to affect anybody except for me. But honestly, I didn't even think that. I just knew I had to get out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. So saying that the next month, my best friend drove me to the abortion clinic and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I remember walking into the clinic and I see some pro-lifers, you know, on the sidewalk. And obviously I hid my face and walked into the building and came into this room where all these ladies are sitting there all waiting for their abortion. Nobody is looking at each other. Mm. And so when I was taken back um, for the procedure, I had not even met the doctor. Nobody counseled me on what my abortion was going to do, physical, mental, emotionally. And I thought my life is going to go on. And when I got off that table and I was bleeding profusely, um, but that was part of the norm inside of me, I knew a, a part of me died along with that procedure. And but at the time, I couldn't acknowledge the humanity of my child. I, th there was no way I could because I don't think I would have done it. And so, but then again, I may have. So after that abortion, I physically healed up. Thankfully, I didn't have any complications. Literally, I would say three to four years of my life, I was struggling with what I know now is post-abortion trauma. And I developed an eating disorder, bulimia, they never ever had it before. And I was using drinking on the weekends, you know, experimenting with illicit, illicit drugs and just thinking that I was the normal college student. Well, not until years later did I realize I was numbing myself with all these other things because I didn't feel any worth mm -hmm. inside of me. Can I ask so, you before you continue, did you tell the father of the child or did you tell anyone besides your friend that you had were pregnant and that I, you had chosen to have an abortion? No, I did tell the father and he essentially said, it's your decision. And he did not, he did not take me there. I did make him pay for some of it but nobody else knew. My parents didn't know, they would have disowned me. My best friend was the only one that knew. Mm. And so I carried that secret for the next four years and I hit rock bottom, Christine. I, my eating disorder was at an all time high. Um, I didn't realize why I didn't make the connection of why I was so depressed and battling these addictions that I finally hit rock bottom and first year med school is when God started. I allowed him into my life and I became a believer and, and it's just only him by the grace of God that I'm still alive to be able to share the story. 
But Christine, even after becoming a believer and getting baptized, I knew, I, I just thought, you know, that abortion's in the past. Why do I need to bring it up? God's forgiven me. There's no reason to, to even bring that back up. So when I became a believer, God started changing things in my life. I started going to Bible studies, learning about who he was, and started attending church and broke off my old unhealthy relationships. But it was not until I met my husband, John, in medical school, Christine, did I realize that that abortion was still very traumatizing to me. Because when we started dating Christine, I was like, I have to tell him. John, to me, at that time, looked like he had never committed any sin. Mm. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> which I know is not true. But he was like, perfect kind of thing. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, if I tell him, he's going to leave me. Mm-hmm. And, and the Lord made it obvious that, okay, Grace, why is this so hard for you? If I have forgiven you, this should not be hard for you. So when I shared it with him, I mean, John was so gracious and he was like, you know, the Lord's forgiven you. I, I, you know, I, I do forgive you as well. So Christine, I thought, wow, this is it. I'm over it. He's not leaving me. I'm good. (laughs) Kind of thing. And we get married two years later. And that's when we started having children. Sarah's our oldest and she'll be 23 this year. And Christine, she was the most lovable baby. Just loved to give hugs, smiling all the time. And then we had Daniel and then I was pregnant with Matthew. And at that time, I was having breakdowns with Sarah because she was just not doing what I was telling her to do. I mean, what toddler does, but (laughs) yeah, but yeah, but Christine, I'm telling you, this is more beyond, you know, just discipline. This was on the verge of rage. I remember when Sarah was two, she had an accident on the floor and I just flew into a rage and I'm like, what is going on? And I threw it in a room. And I mean, that was more, that happened more than I want to say. And one of my sweet friends, Beverly Klein, whom you may know, she started a maternity home here in Tyler. And Bev was one of the first people that I met. And she told me about her two abortions and, and she was safe because she had an abortion. She and I were the only people in the world who's had an abortion. And so At that time, God then brought Bev and said, hey, Grace, I'm I'm leading a study. I really want you to to come to this study. I was like, why do I need to come to this study? I'm fine, Bev. And she just kept persisting. And by then I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me, you need to be in that study, no matter how hard it was for you to go into that study. So Christine, that is one of the hardest things I did was walk into that room full of other women who I know had had abortions. I had all the shame and guilt. And that is when my eyes started opening and I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on with me kind of thing. And so over the next three or four months, we just, we were just bared our souls out. Mm -hmm. We had to talk about all that had happened. You have to go way back. Because the abortion was not the first sin I made. It was everything else leading up to it, you know, Mm -hmm. that led me to that choice. Mm -hmm. And so after that um, personal healing that the Lord, you know, pretty much pushed me into, that is when I finally could acknowledge the humanity of my child, Jonathan. And that is when he told me, you do have a son. You have a son that his very last breath here was his first breath with him. Mm -hmm. And I knew, I knew that God was not condemning me for my choice. And honestly, that was the first time I truly confessed and repented over choosing to end the life of my child. Mm -hmm. Because so many women think, oh, God's forgiven me. Just like I did. God's forgave me. They don't understand that that it could be any sin, you know, and when you know that, okay, maybe God does, he does forgive, 
but did he did I really really feel that forgiveness did I really embrace what he did on the cross for ending the life of my child and carrying that secret for so long are you saying grace that the part of understanding forgiveness is acknowledging specifically what you did and confessing that specifically to God? Yes, you, you have to, just like King David after he had the affair and when he was found out, I mean, he wasn't broken over it until he got found out. Then he got real with God. And it was the same thing with me, Christine. I, I just kept telling myself all these years I, I, that abortion was a previous thing of my past. It was already done and dealt with and God's forgiven me. It's the typical God forgives all sin. Mm -hmm. Not until I expect I took on my full responsibility because I blamed my parents for the abortion. I blamed my boyfriend for the abortion. It was not my, I was the victim. But that study, God just said, no, you are the one that chose it. And until you get broken and you are remorseful for what you have done, the, the blood stains on your hands, you're never going to truly embrace and know the forgiveness that the Lord mm. has been trying to, he is trying to give me. And he spoke through my children. And he was like, if you don't deal with this with me, your children, they are the ones that are going to be affected. It's the people who you live with, who you're the closest with. Because my unworthiness in me, I didn't feel like I had, you know, how could I love my children? Because I didn't have that love within me. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I would have been, Christine, a very very controlling, very perfect, you know, perfectionist mother trying to prove that I could be the good mom and my children were going to excel. And I did not realize that my abortion was all underneath laying all of that. Mm. My motives were wrong. To this day, it, it's just amazing God's grace that he will pour on you but so many people feel it's the unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. They feel, God, you forgive everything else, but you can't forgive me for killing my own child. And Christine, nobody ever says that. I mean, you don't want to say that because it's so raw. But you have to get under, you need to come out from all those layers of self-protection and truly see the sin for what it is. Mm -hmm. And not until that healing did I realize, oh my gosh, Lord, my mom has had an abortion. She is not healed to this day. And everything that my mom is today, that was the last thing I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. She's so lonely and bitter and so angry still. And none of us have a close relationship with her. So mm -hmm. I just knew my children deserve better. My husband deserved better. Mm -hmm what you're saying is that you acted in ways to try to cover up that unworthiness and shame that you felt. So if you can yes. control your children, if you can be perfect, if you can do all these things, it will mask or make up for what you did. Yes. And well, so perfect. I would, yeah. I'd love for you to describe, you've alluded to it, the trauma the things that come out or the, the effects of, of choosing an abortion it seems like when you went to that group that you realized, oh, this is a common theme among women right. who have had abortions. So I'd love for you to speak to that. What are, what, what is this post-abortion trauma that you experienced? Well, the post-abortion syndrome, which I never understood until I went through that study, that abortion breaks the heart in pieces and women, they suffer from the suicide rate is increased. There's no doubt about it. And I have talked to people all over the world, not just across the country, but the suicide rate is so high in women who've had abortions. Depression, anxiety, you know, the loneliness, the, the addictions, the eating disorder. I mean, all of that. And even if you're a believer, 
Do you feel like there's still a wall between you and God? You can't accept that. You, you feel like you're not even worthy of even, you know, of even being forgiven. So the post-abortion trauma, I have seen this time and time again in the studies that we have led other women, you know, through their healing is so real. And the other side wants to tell you that that's just you. This is not truly what every woman experiences, but most women who have not process the abortion or they kept it hidden away they have layers and layers of defense mechanisms christine they don't want people to know who they really are they're not really truly able to give the best of themselves to somebody else mm. because that shame and that guilt is so so much i mean it's crazy this happens also in men men when because when a woman has an abortion the man also has a dead child. Mm -hmm. So regardless if that man wanted for that woman to have an abortion or he did not want that woman to have an abortion, he is still going to suffer the emotional consequences. There's no doubt about it. You cannot end the life of your living child without emotional, psychological consequences. And men really struggle with pornography and they struggle with drinking and, you know, alcoholism and men need healing just as much. That child that's life was ended by abortion. That was just as much his as it was the woman's. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully there is a, there's several abortion recovery ministries that are just for men because men they need to know that the Lord has forgiven them so they can step up to be good fathers, mm -hmm. good husbands, um, be able to lead the family. And most men I know for a fact, when, they, when I've known that they've had an abortion, they haven't dealt with it, I can see it a mile away. I can see all the issues in their life. I mean, honestly, it, it's not just the abortion. There's other poor choices that have been, you know, made during all that, but you can't just ignore it. Mm -hmm. But I've met other abortion recovery leaders that they've done it as couples mm -hmm. when a man and a woman both go through the study together. And honestly, I don't think it, it matters on your gender. If you're a man or a woman, the principles and the reality is still the same. So that is the one thing most men don't realize that my abortion, her abortion it didn't affect me. Honestly, it has. Yeah. Yeah. So, so out that when you went through that study, did you experience pretty quick? Did you feel like there was a 180 yeah. degree change in your life or was it a long process for you? What was that like? It was the start of my healing, that study. And it, the study was three or four months. And not until we were three quarters of the way there, Christine, did we finally experience the forgiveness mm -hmm. that the Lord has been wanting to give us. A lot of women drop out because it's hard work. Who wants to talk about that? Yeah. So, so but through that study and week by week, you're just studying scripture about who God is and, and what he's done for us and, and learning that Jesus came to give us a full life, the abundant life. He didn't come just so we could be crippled in shame and carrying this baggage and wounding everybody else that's around us, blaming yeah. them for our, our problems, you yeah. know? But after that study it was just the beginning of my healing and because there's always more layers to it, mm -hmm. but, but that study did show me, I have no problem sharing my testimony because the abortion is no longer the centerpiece. Mm -hmm. It's all about the Lord and what mm -hmm. he's done for me. And so, so I knew I was free, Christine, because I could tell anybody. About uh -huh. my oh, I love yeah. it. I, I think that is so true. When we, we know when we are truly free and forgiven, when we can talk about it openly yes. with people. Exactly. And, and you do, you started a whole ministry out of this right? Well, yes. Uh, if God had told me that after I did my healing, I would have run the other way. 
So five years, <laughs> five years later, the Lord said, Grace, it's time for you to just start doing Bible studies for women in our area. And I was like, hey, I could do that. That doesn't seem too hard, Lord. And so I started doing studies in the Tyler, East Texas area, and that was in 2007. But we started off under the umbrella of my home church, Green Acres Baptist Church. So, and over the next few years, we just started knowing that for us to reach more women in our community is that we had to get under from the umbrella of our home church. And so we became a nonprofit in 2011. And that's when your mom stepped in and she has been on the board ever since then. And so, and, and we love, we love your mother because she's never had an abortion in her past, but she feels so passionate of this, you know, dire, you know, need that needs to be available because women and men don't know who to talk to about this, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, but but just starting the abortion recovery process in East Texas, we've had the opportunities to do studies in different countries and in different languages. And wow. God is the same God, no matter what language and yeah. what country you live in. Uh -huh. And he does the work. It's absolutely amazing. Can you tell me what it's yes. like to share so openly that people know Grace English she leads this ministry. She's had an abortion. Is that any sort of, do you feel, yeah, any, what does that feel like to you? Well, at first I felt like most people would run the other direction, especially uh -huh. if they had an abortion. If they saw me at the church, uh -huh. you know, they're talking to me. Oh my gosh, I'm going to think I've had an abortion. And so anyways, <laughs> I got kind of used to that, but that didn't bother me because when women are ready, they have picked up the phone and said, I just need to talk. Yeah. We need to go have coffee. Yeah. And that's how several of my women who started on the care board, well, the ministry was, it's called care and it's a, it stands for Christ centered abortion recovery and education. And so several of my women that served on the board in the early years, they had an abortion themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, cause they all come to me and they're like, Grace, we know what you're doing. We just want to help. I was like, okay, have you had an abortion? Uh, yeah. Have you had healing? Yeah, I'm fine. I don't, I don't need it. I don't need the healing. And I was like, well, for you to truly understand what goes on within the closed doors, I would like for you to go through the study mm -hmm. and your mom not being post abortive. She went through the study because you have to see live how these women feel about their past abortions. Yeah, yeah. And so I just think every time that I share my testimony, Christine, that the Lord just, he just reminds me, you know, Jonathan's death is not in vain. And he is bringing hope and healing to women and men who also have other babies who need to be recognized, be given a name, and be a part in just the humanity of it. Yeah. And so I was going to share one little story with you. You know, you asked me how, how did I feel after I sh share my abortion publicly? Well, when I knew the Lord was calling me to do this on a public scale, my children were nine, seven, and five. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to tell my children? Yes, that was actually what I was going to ask you next. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, and so Christine, even though I was fine talking to adults about it, but your own family yes. and John already knew and God knew John has supported me from day one in what the Lord has called me to do. But I remember Sarah was nine. She came into my room and I knew that I did not want them to find out by reading the church bulletin yes. that we were having abortion recovery studies led by me. Right. <laughs> And so when I told Sarah, I said, you know, explain about her brother, whatever, my abortion in college. And she didn't say anything, Christine, but then she came back and she said, mom, when people ask me, do I have two or three brothers? What do I tell them? And so I was like, it's actually three, 
but you do you just say two. <laughs> so, you know, she gets it. Mm-hmm. And then my seven year old child, Daniel, who was very black and white, when I told him, he was like, matter of fact, mom, you know, I would have just had the baby, given it up for adoption, and you could have, you know. <laughs> and so they they were good about it. You know what I mean? They didn't condemn me for it. They had seen already what a broken woman I was already and how God was using that story to further the kingdom. Mm-hmm. And they knew. So honestly, it, it was not difficult, but people have. So when I have women that come into the study and they're like, oh my gosh, do I have to tell my husband? Do I have to tell my kids? I'm like, no, you do not have to do any of that. But most women in their journey one day will tell the people closest to them yeah. because it's no longer, it's not a secret anymore mm-hmm. and the shame is gone. Mm-hmm. And so, and you can celebrate the life of that child. Mm-hmm. And so I know it sounds weird when people talk about aborted children being celebrated, but it's like children who have been miscarried, children that died in infancy. There is this loss. You know, you, you can't go around. How, how can you do not? How can you forget something like that? So Grace, what, what do you want other Christians to know and understand about women who've had abortions? Because we sit in pews at church with many, many women. There are many women right. listening right now who've had abortions. What do you want us to know as fellow believers about, about them? Well, um, first, as fellow believers, the church, I think, has been doing a better job about vocaling that there are women who have had abortions, but it's not about you're going to hell. It's about that is part of your story. There is healing, and these are the resources we have in our community. And so, but some other believers, church members are not necessarily going to be that way. So I think there's education for the church body to be a lot more sensitive about it. Mm -hmm. But as for the post-abortive woman, anytime that the pastor says, speaks the word abortion, that woman is just more withdrawn, you know, and And I felt that way. And I felt like, oh, I'm going to really have to keep this a secret, you know, even much more so. But when women start to see, when they hear of somebody else's testimony, and I'm up there talking about my baby and talking about how my life is a wreck after that. And even after becoming a believer and having the perfect family and, you know, having, you know, whatever it seemed like I had it all. You don't have it all. Mm -hmm. And Satan wants to keep you quiet. Satan wants to tell you, why do you want to go back there? People are going to reject you. Mm -hmm. They are not going to want to be with you. And so I want other women to know that there is at least one other woman in their church. (laughs) One out of three women have had an abortion. Mm -hmm. And even though our stories could have some differences, we all kind of end up at the same place. And, and I want, if you are post-abortive and you've never told anybody, I just encourage you to contact, you know, careabortionrecovery.com. That is our online, you know, you can reach us online and, and we can find help for you no matter where you live in this world. Mm -hmm. And, and, Jesus still loves you. Jesus wants you to be free. And you don't no, no longer need to carry this anymore. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's the same way for post-abortive men. It is so hard to get men to come to the studies, Christine. It really is. And, but I think in some ways, men are truly held more accountable to the Lord because the man is supposed to be the, protector the provider men were you know designed to be the procreator and all of that the abortion just takes it out yeah 
yeah. and they are emasculated yeah. and they don't know how to lead their families. So, you know, I know the Lord is going to bring enough men who are post-abortive to healing for them to be vocal about this as well. Mm -hmm. This is not just a women's issue. No, no. Well, the theme of the season I'm doing is in their shoes. And I'm asking everyone this question. What is, what is something that people don't ask you or are afraid to ask you related to your abortion that you wish they would? Well, one thing I, I thought about that question um, all week. And then this morning, the Lord gave me another one. But anyhow, the first one I was going to tell you is that I wish people would talk to me about the baby that was aborted. And I know that that is strange, but that will give me an opportunity to talk about who Jonathan is. And, and I actually have a brother. If you look in my family tree, there's six people who have been aborted. And this past year, Christine, my brother's passing from abortion really impacted me. And so I bought a statue of a little boy, put him in my flower garden. And it's just a reminder to me about who my brother is, you know, that one day I will be with him. Mm -hmm. And so, so I want people to ask me, how do you feel about your boarded? You know, I, I don't know how you yeah. word that to yeah. make it. <laughs> right. But Christine, you know, you have children too. And like my three kids, they're like the greatest blessings. And they're also unique. And we love to talk about our kids, you know, and then at the same time, but we can't talk about the other child. The other thing that I wish people would ask is that they tell me that. I've had an abortion. I wish they would answer or, or they would ask, or I would, I would ask, how do you think that abortion effect affected you? Because a lot of people don't think about how that abortion has affected them. Even just to live this life, you can't say that you have killed your child. You know what I mean? That's not something you want to put up here in your, in your consciousness. Yeah. It, it's buried down. And I see this in my practice. I have women who've come in who've had past abortions and I'll ask them, well, how has that abortion affected your life? And after I share with them about my story, they're more open about sharing with me about their loss. Mm -hmm. But I would say most of the time they're like, I have never talked about this with anybody. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like because we've made it this political issue that we don't think of it as a personal issue that, right. you know, it's like, it's your choice, do what you want, but we don't talk about this has effects or we don't want to acknowledge. And that is the key. Cause this is not a political issue whatsoever. This is a personal issue. I think if you can get people to understand it, acknowledge the life of the child that, that was ended mm -hmm. and that they can sense that you know you're the one who wants to be able to help them you're not you're not debating whether abortion is right or wrong you're debating and you're not you are sharing with them the loss that you have felt uh -huh. or maybe they haven't felt it yet and because abortion impacts the human heart so so one of the visuals that um, I had come up with this past year is that, that people would understand that abortion has impacted their life. They may not know how on the surface, but it has affected them. So yes, I wish people would ask me, how did your abortion affect you? You know, if they have an hour, I can tell them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, one final question. I'm just thinking for, for listeners who maybe they have opportunities where a friend is, is will trust them enough to share with them that in right. their past that they have aborted a child. How would you encourage us to respond to our friends when they reveal these things to us? I think if it's a true friend, they will feel your loss and they will not condemn you for making that choice. And 
they will be able to pray with you. They, you can tell them there's resources out there that you can meet other women who've had abortions and you are not alone. And one out of three women have had an abortion in this country. And the other thing I was going to say, Christine, is that not only did that abortion um, affect the woman, like in my case, my best friend, Christine, after I went through my healing, I wrote a letter to her and I said, I am so sorry I put you in this position. I'm, you know, she loaned me money to have it done. And we never talked about it afterwards. Mm. And then two, three years later, she's Catholic. Two, three years later, she wrote me a letter. And then she said, please forgive me for taking you to that abortion mm -hmm. clinic. And it affects, it affects you. If you've had, you know, it, it could be your sister, whatever. Abortion affects everybody that you know, mm -hmm. that who knows you. I think if you can see if somebody's really struggling with depression, anxiety, suicide, one of the questions I ask is, have you had a past abortion in your past? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's huge. And they usually will tell me that they have. So I really wish people would be more bold about asking others who are really struggling. You know, I ask people, have you been sexually abused? Have you been abandoned? Have you had an abortion? You know, I kind of stick everything in there. <laughs> so, because if you don't heal from those traumas, you are going to, you're going to be the one that's going to continue to suffer. Yeah. And the people around you are going to continue to suffer. So that's why abortion recovery is so, so needed. Yes. And yes. it's such a beautiful thing, Christine, to watch these women come out as victorious, you know, victorious. It is. And it's all God that is doing it. Yeah. It's yeah. not us. Mm -hmm. And so, so anyhow, that's why I'm so passionate about this. Yes. Well, we can tell. Yeah. And we're so thankful. I'm thankful for the ministry you have in the town where I grew up. And I'm thankful for you being willing to share your story with us today. It's definitely yeah. helped us to to walk in your shoes just a little bit and which helps us to walk in the shoes of our, our neighbors, our friends, our family members, or maybe women yeah. listening who have had an abortion. I, I, our prayer before we started is that God would bring mm -hmm. healing to them and push them toward toward telling someone right. just through your story. So right. thank you so much. And right. tell us yes. the website name of your ministry again. www.careabortion.com. It's C-A-R-E-A-B-O-R-T-I-O-N. Careabortionrecovery.com. Okay. So people can look that yeah. up if they need that. But thanks so much, Grace, for your yes. time today. It was great to meet you. Okay, Christine. Thank you. Friends, I've listed some helpful resources for you in the show notes, including the study that Grace did when she sought healing and forgiveness from the Lord for her abortion, also the ministry that she's leading in East Texas, and a resource for men in abortion. So please go check all of that out. Join me next week as I talk with Laura Wiffler. Laura is the co-founder of Risen Motherhood, a ministry for moms that includes a book and a podcast and many other things. Laura joins me to talk about the joys and challenges that she faces as a mother to a little girl with special needs. We talk about her daughter's diagnosis, how her diagnosis has impacted the whole family, and what Laura would want us to know about how to love our friends who are parenting children with special needs. This is such an important and helpful conversation, so I hope you'll join me next week. Until then, have a great week and keep walking forward by faith.